Does Apple have bad timing with its latest product reveal? In today's cover story, Women and Power, the new effort to get the ladies into the C-suite of energy companies. Plus, the Baltimore Ravens' Ray Rice loses ground as endorsements pull away. And is Netflix about to produce a shocker? First Business starts now. You're watching First Business. Financial news, analysis, and today's investment ideas. Good morning, I'm Angela Miles. It's Wednesday, September 10th. In our first look, Apple's pop and drop. The stock made it up to $103 on the release of a new smartphone and iWatch, but shares ended the day below $98. The investigation is likely to step up into the Home Depot breach. Reports say two senators are calling for a federal probe. Dow Jones reports Microsoft is near a $2 billion deal with Swedish video game maker Minecraft. Stocks landed in the red Tuesday as investors took profits. The Dow dropped 97 points. The Nasdaq wiped out 40. S&P had its biggest plunge in five weeks with a 14-point decline. Gold closed up $3. Oil rose 9 cents. And President Obama tells Congress, I have the authority to tackle ISIS as he prepares to outline his plans today. Larry Chopra of SFG Alternatives joins us now on this Wednesday morning. A lot to get to, Larry, starting with that 10-year Treasury move. What do you think about it? Well, you know, uh, yields around the world have climbed. I mean, keep in mind, they were so oversold for so long and just bouncing back. I'm not sure it's because data has gotten better. Really a technical, just overbought situation. We have the president out today talking about his plan with ISIS. Some people say it's time to buy military stocks. What do you say? Well, it could be. I mean, there's so much going on around the world, and they haven't done as well as the broader market, so maybe it's the time to start to buy. Oil just keeps moving lower. What is that telling you? I think that we're underestimating supply risks, especially with Libya, Algeria, Nigeria, et cetera. Also, refineries in the U.S. are at their peak. They cannot produce anymore. And I have to ask you about Apple. I know a lot of eyes are on that stock today. What will be your trade? Well, I would buy the stock yesterday after they, they uh, announced that the iWatch wouldn't be available until after the holidays. That put a crimp in things. It was a real downer on the stock and closed down. I think the picture is much bigger and clearer than that. It's a good company, a good stock. I would buy it. Thank you, Larry. You're welcome. Chuck Coppola joins me now with more on Apple. Good morning, Chuck. Angie, Apple sure knows how to play the waiting game. After months of speculation, Apple unveiled its latest round of innovation. It includes two new iPhones with larger screens, plus Apple Pay, which lets consumers use mobile devices in place of a credit card. Apple fans got their first glimpse at the Apple Watch. It's the first new device in four years. Tech analyst Rob Enderley says CEO Tim Cook is following in the path of Steve Jobs with the watch, but adds that the gadget has a lot of competition. The market's changed a lot over the last couple of years from when they had the, um, the iPod Nano on a strap. So. I would have thought that they would have put a much more aggressive fashion forward design on this, much like the other manufacturers seem to be doing. Fans took a more upbeat tone on the new products. The iWatch, I actually like better because it's small and it's like a better device and you can keep it around your wrist at all times. A cell phone, you don't know if it's going to fall out your pocket or not. I got an iPhone 5S now. I can't wait for the 6 to come out. I'm going to get a contract and I'm going to get the 6 Plus. The the bigger one. There's a big one and a small one, so I'm going to get the big one. Apple also released HomeKit, iOS-based software for connecting gadgets to your home. Pro traders will be setting up positions today in Apple for earnings this fall and for the holidays, maybe even. Tom White of Red Options Advisors, TD Ameritrade, joins us. Good morning, Tom. And the big event is past us now with that product launch. The next major event for Apple is earnings. What's the options market telling you about the stock price and maybe even volatility in this stock? Right. So uh, prior to the event yesterday in Apple, we saw the stock uh, rally uh, up to almost near all-time highs and then pull back. We saw some ma massive volumes, not only in the option market, but in the, uh, the overall stock. So what we can expect after the uh, post-launch is that Apple shares typically rally into, uh, into the next earnings event or into the holiday season. So typically we'll see Apple from the actual announcement until the product launch rally about an average of 6% historically. And then after the actual phones are released and the products are released, we'll see an additional maybe 2% rise to the upside. So what we're seeing is investors going in, buying upside calls, whether it's the 101s 
102, 103 calls in October, all the way out to January 15. So we're seeing some good anticipation for a further rally in the shares. Tom, thank you for your time today. Thank you. And investors like what they see when it comes to Apple Pay. That's the mobile payment system that's expected to drive new revenue for Apple. But consumers are more skeptical, especially in light of Apple's recent security breach. Matt Schultz of CreditCards.com says it is risky business. They're putting in some, um, some mechanisms to, in order to protect people's credit card information. And as long as there's money, there's going to be people trying to hack. <laughs> and especially something as prominent and high profile as Apple Pay, you're going to have people who are trying to get access to that money. Apple faces competition from Google Wallet and PayPal, which is owned by eBay. Both stocks fell in yesterday's session. Google dropped 1%, eBay tumbled 2%. Facebook moves ahead with a market value that's around $200 billion. Facebook ranks as the 22nd largest company in the world, according to Bloomberg News. Its market value has exploded to the upside as investors count on growth from the company's mobile ad business. Bloomberg's billionaire index lists Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg as the 13th richest person in the world. Facebook shares closed last at $76. On a street known for being very rich, Mario Gabelli tops them all. Gabelli, the founder of Gamco Investors, was ranked the highest paid CEO on Wall Street last year. He brought in $85 million. That's according to SNL Financial. That's as Gamco's assets doubled over the past few years. Executives from KKR and Company, Oak Tree Capital, and BlackRock rounded out the top five. Two more Atlantic City casinos file for bankruptcy. This time it's two Trump Entertainment properties, the Taj Mahal Casino and the Trump Plaza Hotel and Casino. The filings are the latest blow to a city hurt hard by increased competition. The Taj Mahal Casino is expected to close by the middle of November if the company fails to reduce costs. The Plaza property is due to close next week. Another shakeup in sports. Atlanta Hawks owner Bruce Levinson is selling the team after admitting to making racist comments in an email. Levinson confessed to the NBA following the scandal with former L.A. Clippers owner Donald Sterling. Levinson admits that he sent the unintentional and hurtful message that our white fans are more valuable than our black fans. Money losses are mounting for Ray Rice. Rice was cut from the Baltimore Ravens and indefinitely suspended from the NFL after brutal footage of Rice hitting his then fiance surfaced on TMZ. She now, however, is defending his actions. Nike is cutting all ties with Rice and Electronic Arts is dropping his image from a video game. The Ravens sent out a tweet that fans can exchange their Rice jerseys. Rice will keep $25 million he earned as a Ravens running back. In today's cover story, at the top of the world's largest 100 power and utilities companies, the executive board, women account for just 4% of board members and just 12% of senior management teams. Now an effort underway seeks to improve those numbers quickly. In Chicago, 150 women in leadership positions at power and utilities companies held a women's energy summit to discuss why so few of them are at the top. Men are often seen for their potential. Women are judged on what they did. Um, and that's a differentiator that people will use, um, and it's a subtle form of discrimination. A survey of the world's biggest power and utilities companies found not only do women occupy just 4% of executive board positions and 12% of senior management, they also comply just 18% of non-executive directors. Women at power and utilities companies fare better than women in oil, gas, and mining, but organizers of the summit suggest leaders such as Ann Pramajori, president and CEO of Commonwealth Edison, are making a difference. If there is a major storm and we have 100,000 consumers out, she's out in the field and she's speaking. She's relating to the linemen. She's relating to the people who aren't going to get to sleep for 24 hours and she's out there with them. Oftentimes men don't think about, you know, that empath that empathy point. So they don't do that. And that makes a big difference. And that's called bottom-up leadership where, you know, you have somebody at the bottom feeling important and therefore that's going to trickle up and you're going to get the end result that you want. Successful companies engage the entire workforce and we must figure out when we look at the workforce for the future and we look at the change in demographics shame on us if we don't utilize all of our workforce there are some bright spots five of the top 20 utilities companies promoting gender diversity are american including the top two duke energy and sempra energy 
BMW is on a hot streak with sales of its electric car. Sales of BMW's i3 electric model revved up in August. It could be posing a threat to Tesla. Data compiled by Inside EV and Clean Technica finds BMW outsold Tesla Model S last month. The i3 model sells for around $40,000. Tesla's Model S has a sticker price of $70,000. McDonald's posts its worst monthly sales numbers in 10 years. August was also the burger giant's fifth consecutive month of declines. The company reported a drop of 2.8 percent of established restaurants across all regions in August. McDonald's continues to be buffeted by increased competition and shifting consumer demand. Also a major factor, a scandal in Asia over the chain serving expired meat products. Sales in that region fell 14.5 percent. Barnes & Noble is using Booksmarts by cutting costs. The bookseller reported a first quarter loss, but it was less of a loss than expected. Barnes & Noble lost $28 million compared to $87 million in the first quarter last year. The bookstore's next chapter involves separating Barnes & Noble retail from its Nook business to create two publicly traded companies. BKS shares traded up almost 3% Tuesday. Americans are stashing more money away for college. New data finds that the average 529 college savings plan holds around $20,000. While $20,000 is low compared to the overall cost of a four-year public university, it's double what the average Americans had saved during the financial crisis. On to the economic calendar for today. It's the MBA Mortgage Index, Wholesale Inventories, and Crude Inventories. On the earnings calendar, Manchester United, Restoration Hardware, Men's Warehouse, Fair Bradley, and Five Below. Still to come, construction zone. Should the government allow more room for immigration visas in real estate? Plus, cities that have the most new job opportunities sprouting up. And why consumers are rejoicing over prices at the pump and what it could mean for the economy. We'll be right back. Falling gas prices are having a trickle-down effect on the economy. The national average for a gallon of unleaded gasoline is $3.43, a drop of 20 cents from two months ago. That's according to the National Association of Convenience Stores. Jeff Leonard of the NACS breaks down how the lower price is creating a shift in consumer attitudes. We are seeing 9 out of 10 consumers say it has a big impact on their feelings about the economy. Gas prices are down. Consumer confidence is up. That's great news heading into the fall and heading into the, the pre-Christmas uh, shopping season. The survey also finds that young Americans are the group likely to shop the most in the coming months. Adding to consumer optimism is the upward trend in hiring. It's at a seven-year high, according to the Labor Department. Employers hired 4.9 million people in July, up from 4.8 million in June, and the highest level since December 2007. There are now two unemployed people for every job opening. That is down from a peak in 2009 of nearly seven unemployed people for every available job. Cities in the South and Southwest are coming up as the best places to land a job. Manpower Group lists Dallas-Fort Worth as the most employee-friendly with hiring strongest in construction, manufacturing, and transportation. The Dallas area is followed by Houston and McLean, Texas. Phoenix, Arizona, and San Jose, California round out the list. It's International Update Your Resume Month. Yes, there is a month for that. Job website careerpotential.com offers the following spruce up tips. Start a brief statement of who you are, your skills, and how they contribute to the companies where you want to work. Be specific about past jobs, roles, and responsibilities. It's what employers and recruiters place 90% of their focus upon. Use active words such as develop, launch, initiate, those are all good words, and focus the resume on information that's relevant to your career goal. And finally, be honest. Coming up, a cliffhanger for Netflix, why the stock is sitting at a critical level, and after the break, why big demand for U.S. real estate is creating a problem for foreign buyers. Stay with us.
busy times on Capitol Hill. Tomorrow, the House will vote on a stopgap funding bill to keep the government from shutting down October 1st. Yesterday, the Senate Banking Committee heard testimony on Wall Street reform. Also, the Obama administration is pushing forward with a series of measures to shore up the crumbling infrastructure in the U.S., including a half billion dollars in loans for the electric grid. Bill Mahler picks it up from here with the topic of immigration. EB-5, you probably have never heard of it. What it is, in fact, is the government's program that allows immigrants into the U.S. if they agree to invest at least $500,000 in the U.S., and most of that money turns out going into real estate projects. In fact, there are hundreds of projects actually counting on that money. But the problem is the government issues only 10,000 of these EB-5 visas every year, and that is causing some havoc in construction schedules and elsewhere. Let's talk to Bob Knackle. He is one of the guys who runs New York's largest real estate brokerage, Massey Knackle Realty Services. Bob, give us first the scope of the problem. Bill, the scope of the problem is fairly large because the interest in the EB-5 program has been dramatically increasing over the years. In fact, it's doubled every year since 2009, and we're simply running out of visas on an annual basis. How many projects are on hold because of uh, the fact we've hit the cap? I don't have an exact number, but I would imagine it's significant because if you look at the 10,000 visas, that translates to about five to seven billion dollars of foreign capital coming into the market in any one year. And just here in New York, for instance, uh, there's probably 30 billion dollars a year invested into the local market. So if you look at the, the national scope, uh, it's very, very significant and we could use a tremendous uh, amount of foreign capital coming in, certainly more than the program is producing now. Bob, why can't these projects go other go after other forms of financing? Oh, they can, uh, and they have been, and that, that other forms of financing have been readily available, but the EB-5 program of uh, financing is relatively attractive because of the low-cost nature of it, uh, and so a number of developers are trying to tap into that pipeline. You say China is abusing the program. How? Well, I don't know if China's abusing the program. I would say more that they have been uh, predominantly responsible for most of the financing. In fact, about 85% of the EB-5 financing uh, this year has come from China. Uh, and it just seems that they are more up to speed on uh, the mechanics of the program and how to access it, um, much more so than, than other countries. Um, you know, in, in the investment sales arena generally, uh, the two most prolific investors from outside the U.S. have been our major trading partners, Canada and Mexico. Uh, but China has really beefed up their uh, interest in the program and is starting to uh, deploy much more capital into the marketplace uh, than they have in the past. Well, Bob Nackle, thanks very much. I know the government is listening, and let's hope uh, it makes some adjustments to, to uh, get the bottleneck out of the pipeline. Thanks so much. You got it, Bill. Still ahead, is Netflix a buy as that stock seems set on reaching $500? Plus, one last check on Apple. Chart Talk is next. Hey, Chart Talk this morning. James Romali of KingOfTheMarket.com joins us to talk about Netflix and more. Good morning to you, James. Good morning. Let's start with that Netflix situation. Analysts say it could go to $600. Where do you see the stock going? So the stock made a new all-time high today on those comments from the analysts at RBC, raising their price target from $530 to $600 based on its potential for growth in Europe. And I completely agree. I think that is a huge opportunity for Netflix. We're seeing very strong subscriber growth here in the U.S. And this is going to be the next thing that's going to take the stock a leg higher. So going forward, every time they release earnings, that's the number that I'm going to have my eyes glued on is their overseas subscriber growth and I think it really could push the stock higher. I know a lot of people who wish they would have bought that stock a lot sooner. Let's move on to Apple for a final look there. What's in the cards for trading today on Apple? Very interesting move out of Apple yesterday. The stock tore higher on the announcement of the Apple payment solutions, Apple Wallet, but the stock top ticked intraday as they got into the details on the new watch. So it seems like investors love Apple Wallet and maybe are so-so on the watch. So it'll be interesting to see how the stock shakes out today. What are you going to be doing? I'm looking to play Apple flat for the next week or so as all the big money positions itself and the stock finds a little bit more direction just off of the highs here. James, thanks so much. Thank you. That's it for now. Coming up tomorrow, our film critic will have his first take on blockbuster movies that could come out of this year's Toronto Film Festival and find out if Dolphin Tale 2 will make waves at the box office. We hope you'll be back. From all of us at First Business, thank you for watching.